Well, it, really the night before was when uh, things were very, I think, interesting from the standpoint that we had so much optimism. The car had ran really fast and happy hour. Felt like that we could really be a factor. Made a call to my brother, told him that, I know this may sound crazy, but the car's good enough. If I can stay out of trouble, I think I can win this race. Next from CBS Sports, the Great American Race, the Daytona 500. Put yourself in Kenny Schrader's shoes. For three years, he's had the fastest car. He's sitting on the pole. Put yourself in Dale Earnhardt's seat. He's won just about every race there is to be run, but he's never won the Daytona 500. That morning, Dave Despain came over, interviewed me. Uh, all the excitement, you know, I think was, was building, obviously getting to pit road to be out there for the start of all the activities and the functions and things. And it was an exciting time and the whole atmosphere was uh, was building to uh, to get this thing started. Winston Cup replays are brought to you by Purolator, the first name. Purolator also has a major presence in the world of motorsports, as it has for nearly two decades. Throughout the 1970s, Purolator dominated the world of NASCAR stock car racing, as legendary drivers like David Pearson and A.J. Foyt drove the Purolator Mercury to victory in more than 50 super speedway events. Purolator is back on the NASCAR track as sponsor of up-and-coming driver Derek Cope, a future star in the NASCAR Winston Cup Series. It started in 1987. I was living on a mattress in a two-bedroom apartment above a garage and pretty much was destitute. Visa cards were maxed out and I went to a hotel room. I got a call saying that uh, there was an opportunity for sponsorship and I needed to go to Tulsa. So I donned the only suit I had and I had enough money to get a ticket to fly to Tulsa and off I went. I think that, that day uh, in Tulsa at 2 Warren Place, something that I'll never forget, uh, getting in the, in the corporate boardroom, and there was Carol Warner, the then president, and Terry Weber, the VP of marketing, and David Downing. And I remember telling Carol that I would do whatever it took. I would give you whatever amount of appearances it would take. And I said I would do them for nothing. But I guarantee you that you'd want to pay me next year. I said because I was that proficient outside the race car. I had a lot to learn in the race car, but I felt like I was that good outside the car. Carol Warner told me to go to lunch and come back and they were gonna discuss some things. And when I came back, we sat down and Carol said, this is a little unorthodox, but he said, you have a sponsorship. You need to go back to Charlotte and find yourself a race team. You have $375,000, I'm keeping $25,000 for marketing. And he said, we're going racing. And that's where it started. The Purolator Commitment to Excellence. Thanks for joining me for a look inside Purolator. I believe it was my 72nd start. We had missed the race the year before. We had gotten crashed in the uh, 125 qualifying race. So I'd only had two starts prior to this one here in 1990. This is Racing's Cathedral of Speed, the Daytona International Speedway, drying out after an all night rain. The thing that I think sticks out the most for me was I remember getting in the car early and sitting there, which I always like to do. I always like to sit in the race car and, and really just kind of get within myself. The moment you get your earphones in, you can really just, you can hear your heart beating. And I was just kind of eerily calm. Buddy Parrott was, I think, the driving force. His input about keeping the car uh, under me, driving within myself, not making any mistakes, and take care of this thing because it's a long race. You have to get to the end. He says, there will be a caution. We'll be in a position to win this thing. We'll have a shot at it. And he said, that's all you can ask for. Seven-time winner, Richard Petty, alongside from the Northwest, Derek Cope. Well, starting six row outside, I, I remember that, you know, it was a great place to be. I liked the outside line. And immediately, the car took off and we started passing cars. And I think we got to eighth place really quickly from 12th. Uh, got in the top five, faded back a couple times, but, but it ran right around the top five to top eight there for a long segment. I remember the car being free pretty much the whole day. I was pedaling the car, uh, just really just on and off the throttle, very, very minutely, just trying to take care of the car and just trying not to make a mistake. Derek Cope's number 10, Earnhardt's number three, Slicing down along the inside, that comes up to second for Cope, Earnhardt to third. Derek Cope using Hendrick Motorsports engines this year in his Chevrolet. And he's running very, very strong. And he's running right over the leader, number six, Mark Martin, as they come back to the stripe. We had taken the lead several times, but obviously it was short-lived. 
Dale was very strong. Uh, he was coming right for the front. But we were able to always, whenever he got by us, I was able to stay with him. When he wasn't lifting, I was pedaling the car and I was just taking care of it. I could tell that we were in the top two, top five all day long, so there was no real point to really press the car. But he had already said, just take care of the car. Eric Cope dips down now to come into the pits. And the turning point came probably late in the race when we made our final stops that were under green. The car's loose. And I said, uh, you know, we need to tighten this thing up. So when we came in, but he put left side tires on, which would help tighten the car up, but he beat the spooler down to get more speed. I saw him beating the back of the spooler down through the, through the uh, mirror. And so off I went and uh, I had no recourse. At that time, I had what I had, and Buddy said that was gonna be the last stop. They're back underway. There was five laps to go, and I was in the lead. I probably made a mistake. I got out a little too far, and I didn't have any real help. Here comes Dale. He went to the bottom with four laps to go. He made a move going off into turn three, and he got by me. Jeff Bodine followed him. I had to pull down on Jeff, and I had to pack some air on him to try to stop his, his effort. He was a lap down, not knowing at the time, but I was able to get enough air on him to slow him down, and I managed to do away with him. I took off, and I started running Dale down. Slowly but surely, I was making headway. And then here come Terry Labonte for giving me a little bit of help as well. Pulling back up on Earnhardt comes Derek Cope in that red Chevrolet number 10. My car was loose. I'd be on Dale's bumper going in turn one every time. But as you can see, the car would just drift up. I'd have to give the car its head and I'd take the higher line. I had to keep the car underneath me. Dale had fresh tires so he could run the line that I wanted. If you watch Dale, he kept kind of moving up the racetrack. He kept trying to protect the high side because he knew that that's where I was going. I was trying to get a run off the high side to create the momentum to come down the back straightaway. And each lap, it would get me back to him going off into turn three. So at that time, Bill Elliott had shut Bodine loose with three to go, and they tried me together down the back straightaway. And I remember looking in the mirror and seeing Terry Labonte and Bill Elliott move to the inside to try to pass me, and they couldn't do it. They had to pull back in line. I knew then it was about Dale and myself, and that those guys, I had to use them to help me, but it was gonna come down to Dale and I. Dale was fast. Cope driving the race of his career, stays in second place. The Spanaway Washington campaigner moves in again on number three, Earnhardt. And look at it moving up there, that Pure Leader sponsored car, Pure Leader is being sold now. But on the last lap, going off into turn one, I had a great run coming out of four and going off into one, I was on his bumper and I was hoping that I, I could just keep the car you know, in his line, and I drifted a little bit on the high side. I lost a little ground coming off of two. Four car shoot. Down the back straightaway, I started gaining some momentum. Here come Terry, and we started to go. Off into turn three, I could see myself starting to go. I said, I gotta go to the bottom. Go to the bottom no matter what. I drove the car to the bottom of the racetrack. Lucky thing I did, because that car turned sideways, up he went, and I drove by him. Half a lap to go. Here comes Duke Coke down on the inside. Oh, Earnhardt has Earnhardt a problem. Slopping back. I looked in my mirror and I said, Terry, you got nothing left. The Daytona 500 is ours. And sure enough, that's how it went. And I blocked him all the way down to the start finish line. We come across there and there was total pandemonium at that point in time in the radio. The guys were screaming. I get chills just thinking about it. Well, at that moment in time, I was pretty reflective about my father and um, about the vision he had and what we had accomplished in 10 years. And, you know, I just, I knew then that I had to get out of the race car and I had to do what my father would expect, and that is represent uh, the company, Pure Later, uh, and myself in a, in a class fashion. Derek Cope, Spanaway, Washington, becomes the fourth driver to make the Daytona 500 his first career victory. Yeah, it was an emotional time, you know. Buddy and Judy there, the wind, crying, everybody in total amazement of what we just accomplished, right? Come down Pitt Road and, you know, I had to ask Buddy, I said, Buddy, I said, where's Victory Lane? Crew Chief Buddy Barrett, what did he say? He don't know where Victory Lane is. <laughs> Can you figure out how to navigate him in there? You know what? It's, uh, it's really a wonderful deal. You're sitting there, it's hot. You're out of breath because you've held your breath for the last five laps and you're in victory lane and you know you're trying to compose yourself you got your helmet off you got your hat you've wiped your face and then they ask you they say okay yeah we're gonna go in 10 seconds here right and then boom they tell you okay it's time to go come on out you stand on the ledge of the of the door and you're with your hands raised and i mean you're just super excited and you jump down and then they stick a microphone in front of you has won the daytona 500 can you believe it 
Absolutely not. I'll tell you what, you know, in my wildest dreams, you know, you, you, you always come down here with optimism, but you know, this is this is the one that eludes everybody. And Daryl Walter did it last year, you know, for the first time in his career. And it is a pleasure to have the Pure Letter Chevrolet Aluminum up front and take the win like this. It's it's a dream come true. You played professional baseball. You came down here to race with virtually no money last year. And now you've won the biggest prize in all of this sport. Tell me about the pass for the lead. Well, you know, Earnhardt was dominant all day long. We, I, there was no way I was going to get him. I was just trying to hold off Terry Levani, but It's something special. It, it's hard to explain the magnitude of this event, how life-changing it really is. Uh, it's one moment in time that changed a lot of us. And uh, I think we, we didn't know at the time just how big a win that thing really would be. And something that would uh, you would think about 30 years later and still uh, remember it so vividly. Uh, closing your eyes and feeling the warmth of the sun on your face in Victory Lane, just total jubilation. Back in that time, in 1990, the sport was in its heyday. The filming for the Days of Thunder was in this actual race, the two cars that start at the back of our race. For a company like Pure Later, who was really rebranding and really trying to gain a lot more exposure and uh, looking for a branding initiative, to go out and win the Super Bowl and showcase the Pure Later filter brand in that manner, it was just, uh, I think, the start of a lot of great things for, for Pure Later filters and Derek Cope and, and Bob Whitcomb Racing. Things changed. Uh, it elevated my notoriety extensively. Uh, I was off to New York City to be on the David Letterman show. And I remember sitting in the green room thinking to myself, wow, I'm going to be on David Letterman. And, you know, they get the call and out you come through the door and come around the corner. And hey, Derek. How you doing? Congratulations. Nice to see you. Huh? I have a seat there. How long have you been driving stock cars? Uh, about 11 years. 11 years, and what was your best finish prior to this? Uh, six twice last year. Six twice last year. So that's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, it is. In yeah. Winston Cup today. Yeah, this is a very competitive sport, isn't it? Very much so. Uh, and if you're going to win one race in your career, I guess the Daytona 500 would be that one, huh? Yeah, if you're going to win one, Daytona would be the one. Yeah. But now at 195, what can you do in there? Can you look around? Can you look in the mirrors? I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, are you, can you actually look anywhere but right in front of you? Well, you know, it's, it, I think speed's relative. Uh, you know, you become accustomed to driving that fast, and then things you react to it that, that quickly. Uh, it's like when you drive 70 miles an hour or 80 miles an hour, then you drop back down to 35. Mm -hmm. It feels like you can do anything. Yeah. Well, that's what it is running 195. I have time to look in the mirror, uh, uh, look to the side a little bit, to look at all the gauges. So it's... But what would be the top limit of that? At when, you know, is like 200 miles an hour you can handle that? 250? Could you handle that? I don't know. I've never been 250. Yeah. Uh, I've 202, 203 is about as fast as I've been. 250, I guess, would be murder on your hair. Just a thought. <laughs> the hair was, uh, there was nothing they were going to do to that hair. That hair was uh, a lot of height and a lot of length. 1990 uh, special, I guess. Nobody's winning like the heartbeat of America. It started in 1987, where I met Jim Malone, Carol Warner, and Terry Weber, who gave me this opportunity. To be a stable fixture in this sport at this point in time still is truly something special for me. And to have Starcom Racing, Mike and Matt Kohler and Bill Wallerman, who have given me the opportunity to be back in the Cup Series as a general manager. So the mere fact that we're all together here to remember and to share the moment that we made in 1990 by winning the Daytona 500 is truly remarkable. One year ago, Bob Whitcomb nearly disbanded his team. They had run out of money. There was no hope left. But he stuck with it, and now he has won the great American race with Derek Cope as driver.